Um, let's bow our heads as we get ready for our study this morning. Father in heaven, I pray for the help of the Holy Spirit, uh, that he will fill our hearts and our minds, that you will use, that he will use these words to bring us closer to you, to understand Jesus more deeply. Give us your grace, dear Lord, please, as we study in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I've been waiting for the opportunity to get to the passage we're going to look at today. <clears throat> it is probably one of my favorite stories in the gospel. And it's actually recorded by all three of the synoptic gospels. Matthew and Luke place it as occurring a little later in their accounts of the life of Christ. Mark places it right at the beginning of his narrative. And it's the story of the cleansing of the leper that is found in Mark chapter 1, verses 40 through 45. And I'm sure that, that many will find some parallels between uh, the culture and uh, the issue of leprosy in the first century when Jesus was there with, with what we deal with here. Before I read these verses, I want to remind you of something that I spoke to you about at the beginning of the series on the Gospel of Mark. Mark is the briefest of the gospel accounts of the life of Christ. But there are things added by Mark that are not found in the other gospels. So I want to refer to Matthew and Luke's account of the story first, because I want you to hear those accounts of what happened, and then to hear what Mark adds to this event. So the first passage is in Mark chapter 8, verse 1. It says, when he had come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, a leper came and worshiped him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately the leprosy was cleansed. Now listen to Luke's account in Luke chapter 5, verse 12. And it happened when he was in a certain city that behold, a man who was full of leprosy, saw Jesus, and he fell on his face and implored him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then he put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately the leprosy left him. So those are Matthew and Luke's account of this story. Now I want you to hear and to listen carefully to Mark, Mark's account of the story. And I'm going to read the whole story as it's found in Mark chapter 1, verses 40 and on. Now, a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him and saying to him, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. As soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. And he strictly warned him and sent him away at once, saying, and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go your way to show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing those things which Moses commanded as a testimony to them. However, he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the matter so that Jesus could no longer openly enter the city, but was outside in deserted places, and they came to him from every direction. Jesus moved with compassion. There were those that day who, when they realized who it was that was crowding past them to get to Jesus, almost climbed, climbed over the people around them to get away from this man, who, according to Luke, was full of leprosy. In other words, the disease was in an advanced state. His body was full of it. In the time of Christ, when he was here on earth, nothing was more feared than leprosy. In fact, in the world today, leprosy is still one of the most feared diseases in the world. Almost 18 years, or probably better than that now, except probably closer to 20, I spent five, a five-week sabbatical working for Adra Nepal. I told the, um, you know, I told the director uh, of uh, Ralph Watts, who was the director of Adra at the time, that uh, I was given this sabbatical and a lot of people did some very educational things, but I wanted to get back. And so um, he arranged for me to work with Adra Nepal. One of the things that I did while I was there in Nepal was I assisted at the construction site of a school uh, that was at a leprosy colony. It was a colony built by the Nepali government that was turned over to Adra to operate. Now, leprosy is a curable disease. 
And when these individuals had been treated, ABRA made arrangements with the government to build these small homes for these people in the hillsides around that leprosy colony to move them out of the buildings that originally housed them. They were like gigantic warehouses. You can see the picture of uh, of these uh, buildings, great big, huge white buildings. When I was there, the director of ABRA told me that, uh, that the buildings uh, that were designed for maybe 800 people were, were housing close to 2,000. There were people living in the rafters of those buildings. And ABRA ran an industrial school to give the children of these lepers a trade that they could support their families with. And so they gave me the tour while I was there of this school. This is the carpentry school. And they taught these people, they taught the children of these people that had leprosy a basic carpentry skill so that they could earn a living to support their families. The other was a mechanical school uh, where they learned how to work on uh, machines and cars and vehicles. The elementary school that was used to educate the younger children was like a, a giant chicken coop. And it was just crowded to the walls with children. So Adra came and built an elementary school that was larger, that would actually house the number of children that were coming. You know, I, I saw the, the deformities up close that were the result of uh, the leprosy. I never quite had the chutzpah or something to get right in their face with a camera and take a picture of them. But I saw people who had no fingers. I saw people who had their facial, their faces had been terribly, terribly uh, damaged by the, the inroads of the disease. Um, their, their noses were gone in many cases. Their ears were gone. They had been uh, significantly scarred by this terrible disease that would destroy the connective tissue uh, of their body. But even in this modern age of medicine and medical knowledge, the fear of leprosy, even though now we can cure it, is still tangible and it's terrifying. And in Nepali culture, leprosy is believed to be a curse of the gods. It's interesting and very close to the way they viewed it in Christ's time. In Christ's time, when he was here on earth, leprosy had another name. You know what it was called? It was called the finger of God because it was believed that when you committed a terrible sin, God would reach out and touch you with his finger and you would contract leprosy. So along with the humiliating disfigurement and debilitation caused by the disease came the shame of having others believe that you were guilty of some terrible sin. You were supposed to tear your clothes, put ashes on your head and cry out, unclean, unclean. The very air that you breathed <clears throat> was considered tainted. If leprosy was suspected, you had to present yourself to the priests. And if it was confirmed, you couldn't even go home to say goodbye to your family. No last hugs from your wife. No farewell kiss from your husband. No final words to your children. From the moment of the diagnosis, your life was over. You were to leave society shouting, your malady to everyone within hearing distance. And no one was immune. Even kings were forced to leave their thrones if they contracted leprosy. <clears throat> Can you think of a more terrible outcome uh, than to be cut off from everything and everyone that had meaning to you? People lived with the terror of coming in contact with anyone who was afflicted with this terrible disease. And now, to become the very thing that you feared and dreaded the most. What a terrible sense of terror must have filled this man's heart the day that he received that fateful diagnosis from the priest at the temple. He's barely able to take it all in and he's already being driven from the city as an outcast, being ordered to cry out, unclean, unclean. What would you do if you were in his place? How would you feel if it was you, not he, that had received that awful news? You know, except for Naaman in the Old Testament, there were almost no stories of anyone ever being healed from leprosy. In fact, the scholars of Christ's day compared the possibility, possibility of being healed from lepros, leprosy to the possibility of being raised from the dead. 
That may be the reason why the gospel writers included the story. But it also leads to some very interesting questions about this story. The gospel accounts of the life of Christ don't give any indication that there were other healings of leprosy beyond this point. But the man comes, falls down before Christ and says, if you are willing, you can make me clean. How did he know that Christ could help him or would help him? The Tsar of Ages tells us that there were a great many sufferers of leprosy in Palestine when Christ was there. And word reached them of the miracles that Jesus had performed and hope began to come to life in their hearts. But they were barred from coming anywhere near the centers of population. But in one man's heart, hope gave birth to action. He knew that to go near populated areas could cost him his life, but he was going to die anyhow. So what did it matter? He was determined to find Christ no matter what the outcome. What else compelled him, we may never know until we see him in heaven and we can ask him. Maybe it was the desperation he felt as the disease slowly ate away his body. Maybe it was the loneliness that made living unbearable. Perhaps it was the sense that death was nearing and that his life was about to end. But as he heard the stories of how Christ healed others and that no one was turned away, faith began to come to life in his heart. You know, I find it interesting that his words to Jesus were, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Not, if you are able, please make me clean. Somehow already in his heart is the assurance that for Christ, this miracle is possible. He doesn't doubt Christ's ability. He's heard enough to know that the Lord is able to remove the curse. But his experience with the religion of his day has taught him that it's possible that Jesus is going to see him as a great sinner. And in humility, he casts himself at Jesus' feet with the cry, if you are willing. You know, I've always loved what happens next. And I love the way Mark puts it. Then Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing to be cleansed. He touched him. This man hadn't felt the warmth of human touch for who knows how long. This man, who was nearly consumed by a desperate loneliness, felt the touch of Christ. You know how important the human touch is? Research has been done on the emotional impact on children of being deprived of appropriate touch from mom and dad. Jesus saw the disease, but he saw something else. He saw the desperate loneliness, and in compassion, he reaches out and touches this man, and instantly the disease was gone. You know, it's important not to miss one major point. The gospel writers repeatedly emphasize the divinity of Jesus Christ. Leprosy was called the finger of God, that when you sin, God would reach out with his finger and touch you and you would contract leprosy. But the story tells us that when Jesus touches us, when God, God incarnate in Jesus Christ touches us, it does not bring disease, it does not bring death, it brings healing and wholeness and life. Jesus came to bring life, not death. He came to touch humanity and to win men and women for his kingdom. We don't have to fear the touch of Christ, do we? We don't have to fear the touch of God because it always brings healing. You know, I've tried to understand why this story means so much to me. I think there are a great many of us who understand the feelings that this man must have had. Now, perhaps you were raised with a healthy self-image. I'm 
I'm not trying to sound cynical or sarcastic. If you grow up with a sense of being truly loved in your home, if you grow up in a good family and a good environment, don't feel out of place by what I'm going to say. I'm grateful for the fact that that I married Sandy, that that she was able to bring into our home the stability that had been a part of her home as a child. But there are a lot of people that don't have that privilege. <clears throat> there are a lot of people that feel a whole lot less than whole in life. <clears throat> there are a lot of people that carry in their heart the legacies of abuse or cruelty or neglect. There are many that bear a load of guilt for on their conscience for the things that they've done that were wrong. And they're not sure whether coming to Christ will result in just one more colossal rejection. <clears throat> Many feel keenly the sense of failure over mistakes. Perhaps the rejection of a spouse who chose to exit the relationship. Many hide the shame of abuse afflicted on them as children. Some are swallowed by the guilt of, of bad decisions. They come to church fearing that if Christ were here, he might ask them to leave. After all, they're not perfect. Their hearts are burdened with shame and self-loathing. And on some intuitive level, they can relate to the experience of this man. They know the fear that he must have felt as he approached Christ. But for many of us, there comes a moment just like him when desperation overwhelms our fears and compels us, even in the face of possible rejection, to push forward. This man was so desperate to see Jesus that he went there. He went where he wasn't supposed to be. He presses through the crowd looking for the one face that he's certain he's going to recognize. And when he sees Jesus, he cries out, if you are willing, you can make me clean. I believe that Jesus, when he looked into that face, instantly read the years of agony that the broken-hearted loneliness, he saw it all, the shame, the crushing desperation, and he was moved with compassion for this poor, broken soul. All of us come here doing a pretty good job of hiding the scars and wounds. We put on our good Sabbath clothes. We, we, we meet everybody, and, but Jesus sees it all as it really is. He sees what lies underneath all the finery. He knows what burdens we carry. He knows about the loneliness. He knows about the desperation. And he looks at us with compassion. He's promised to forgive our sins and to heal our heart. Others might have rejected you, but he won't. You may feel alone and desperate, but he has promised that he would never leave you or forsake you. Whatever problems you've had in your life, he welcomes you into his presence today and longs not to just touch you, but hold you in his mighty arms. The story of the leper is the story of the worst of rejects, who is met with compassion and infinite love. Our story is the story of the wounded and the rejected and the timid and fearful being met with infinite tenderness and compassion. We serve a God who knows everything that there is to know about you and me. Whatever you have successfully hidden from everyone else, he knows. We serve a God who knows everything there is to know about us. And he still longs for that opportunity to put his arms around us and to bring healing to our hearts, our minds, and our bodies. Whatever it is that has made you hesitant to worship before God today, our Savior looks at you with great compassion and says to us, I am willing to be made clean. Nothing and no one is beyond his reach. No sin is so great that it cannot be forgiven. No sorrow is so deep that he cannot console us. No anxiety so overwhelming that he cannot calm your fearful heart. Aren't you glad that we serve a God who is the embodiment of mercy and compassion? Aren't you grateful 
that we serve a Lord who offers to forgive every sin, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, and to draw us to himself. I'm so grateful today that we serve a God who looks beyond what everyone else sees. And he sees that inner heart of ours that longs for cleansing and longs for healing and longs for his touch. Would you like to have Jesus touch you today? To reach out his hand and touch you today like Jesus did. Father in heaven, I bring my church families to you, the Brookstone Spring Hill churches and all of everybody that is on with us today, wherever they're from, Ohio or New York, wherever it happens to be. Fill their hearts with a sense of your grace and your strength. Fill their hearts with the assurance that you love them, that it is your longing desire to hold them in your arms and to bring healing and wholeness, that you long to touch their lives. And, and make them well. We give ourselves to you today again. We pray for your grace. We pray, dear Lord, that we will be drawn to you. We pray for that reassurance that only your spirit can give as he dwells in our hearts, that we are accepted and loved in Jesus. Bless this Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.